happy Friday night, everybody. How's everyone doing? Welcome to the fourth episode of Piano Star Masterclass, brought to you by Piano League. I'm your host, Brian Lin, a professional pianist and a piano teacher. Ever since I graduated from Juilliard a few years ago, making piano education accessible to everybody has been one of my main goals. And that's why I created the series, the Piano Star Masterclass. It starts with a 30-minute interview with a professional pianist, followed by an hour of live streamed piano lessons taught by that pianist. During the live stream, you can ask us any questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. But remember, you can also sign up to be a performer. We have one more spot left in April, so apply soon. Piano Star is all about giving piano students virtual performing opportunities. So besides the masterclass, we also have the Piano Star Showcase an hour-long virtual concert for young pianists ages 7 to 12. Application deadline is today, tonight. So the repertoire is only one piece. If your kids or students are within that age range and you want to give them a chance to perform, this is your last chance. Apply by midnight tonight. Now, I'd like to introduce our guest teacher today. As a soloist, he has performed with numerous orchestras as well as played in recitals across the United States Poland, Austria, and Germany. He is currently working as a departmental accompanist at Davidson College in North Carolina and continues to perform nationwide. He is a concert pianist, chamber musician, organist, and educator. He completed his undergraduate studies at Rice University, graduating magna cum laude with degrees in piano and philosophy. He later received a Master of Music degree in Piano Performance at the Peabody Institute, where he is currently a doctorate candidate. So everybody, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Polish-American pianist Tomasz Robach. Welcome. Welcome, Tom. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So um, first question, how are you holding up in the, in, in, in the current quarantine? What, are you, what have you been up to? Well, uh, a lot of extra time at home, obviously. Uh, not probably as much piano work as I had anticipated, but it's been, uh, it's been an opportunity and a way to spend a little bit more time with my, with my young daughter, who's a little bit over two, so... Gotcha. A bit, bit of a silver lining, I think. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So uh, our audience may not know Tom has a lovely two-year-old daughter. <laughs> so, um, so our topic today, because since we only have 30 minutes, so I'll just jump right in. Sure. Um, it's about sight reading. So for the beginner audience out there, sight reading is, how would you des uh, describe sight reading? <laughs> Uh, well, I guess the, the running definition is you get a piece of music in front of you and you are meant to play it at sight. So, right. it's, so you it's play not something. So much, Go ahead. Not so much just the reading, but actually the playing of it as you're reading it along. Right. So you're playing something that you haven't seen before or you haven't learned before for, for mm -hmm. the first time. So what has uh, your own experience been with uh, with sight reading and and uh, what made you want to talk about this topic today? Well, I think it's a really important topic. And I think it's kind of, uh, it's a topic that everybody wants to know more about. And we kind of think about it, but it's always at the tail end of so many other concerns uh, when it comes to piano playing. For me, obviously, it, as, a, as an accompanist here at Davidson, I, I apply this every day in my work. So I can speak from experience in saying that Certainly the job itself, having to read a lot of new music constantly has made me a better sight reader. And that experience in the last six to eight months uh, has, has made me want to talk about it now as well. Uh, although I've, I've been using that skill most of my life in a variety of contexts, whether it's uh, playing for churches or even getting a graduate assistantship at Peabody, sight reading played a, an important part. and. Um, I actually had the pleasure of teaching sight reading at Peabody as well as, as a graduate assistant to some of the undergrads there, uh, the, the freshman piano majors. 
Oh, so, oh, so they have a sight reading class right now? There is a sight reading. There is I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah there is a sight, oh, okay. sight reading class. Uh, was it, it doesn't get a lot of glory, but. <laughs> was, it a, was it a new class or has it always it, been? It's a, always been a part oh. of the curriculum for undergraduate pianists. Oh, for yeah. undergraduate, that's why I didn't know. I see, sure. I see. So, wow. So you must have a lot of experience in this. So in your opinion, uh, what are some of the benefits to, to being able to sight read or sight reading regularly? Well, uh, I'd like to maybe talk about that, not just from my own perspective, but from something that was written 100, about 100 years ago. Uh, it's a quote I came across a long time ago, and it really made me think about this uh, probably when I was about, I don't know, 21 or two. Um, this comes from the Dohnani exercises, which are, I guess, pretty well known as, as some good tec technical exercises that you can use. And in the introduction, he writes this, which is kind of surprising for a technical book, quote unquote, and, and we'll talk about that maybe. But he says, a wide knowledge of musical literature cannot, can only be acquired by sight reading. I cannot sufficiently recommend pupils to start early with sight reading, piano as well as chamber music. I do not mean playing a piece once through, but to play it several times so as to become well acquainted with it. It may be argued that this could lead into superficial, untidy playing, the disadvantages of a lot of sight reading, though, can be balanced by stricter demands put to the pupil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then much sight reading has advantage, which is which are unfortunately not sufficiently considered. Uh, and basically, he goes on to say that you acquire a tremendous knowledge of the musical literature and sense of style, and actually that your technique also improves because you are uh, doing a lot of things subconsciously and maybe not adding uh, certain levels of self-conscious tension into what you're what you're trying to achieve. Gotcha. And have you? Do you think have you reaped some of those benefits yourself when, when you're I trying do, to start? I do think so, especially the the stylistic idea and just being able to read many many pieces by different composers. You you really start to get much a much better sense of how to approach a new piece after all that. Right. So you get to experience a bunch of more a bunch more new repertoire where versus if you were just if you had to just learn something because it takes way longer does certainly that, and that certainly right? the way that we learn it typically which is memorizing it and etc it, it's a much longer process and if you can use some of your energy not just to memorize but to just read for pleasure for fun and to get to know more music uh, that'll make note learning later for a piece that you're trying to learn for performance also much faster Gotcha. Um, and in your opinion, do you think the skill of sight reading should only be uh, applicable to advanced pianists, uh, intermediate pianists, or can pianists of all levels uh, learn this, or uh, should pianists of all levels learn to sight read? I think certainly it should be taught as early as possible. Um, I think it's it's a really important skill and it should not be overlooked, especially in the early education of pianists. I know there's so much that we need to do when we're teaching pianists in the early levels, but I've found in all of my adjudicating, especially whenever there's a sight reading component that tends to be pretty weak. <laughs> um, and I think that that's not to say that teachers are not aware of it, but again, it's, it's just on the list of things that we typically think about in terms of priorities, it tends to sit pretty low, but I challenge people to think about maybe bumping it up a little bit higher and seeing what the benefits of that can be. Right. And then we'll get to some specific examples later. Um, why do you think uh, sight reading is so difficult, especially for, I guess, beginners, but I guess not just for beginners, but why, why is it so difficult? I think that that ties into what I just said about, we have so many concerns as pianists for kind of precision and perfection and quotes and, uh, interpretation and memorization uh, and just kind of focusing on the repertoire component as something that has to be very polished and we tend to just kind of put it by the wayside our teachers might even tell us to do it and I know from my own life when I was younger I kind of didn't really listen to that until I, I sort of knew better and so we have to keep reminding people especially younger pianists that it, it actually is really useful and, and uh, you know really important now, when you say younger pianists, how young are we talking about? <laughs> when, how, when, when should one start learning sight reading? 
Yeah, give me an age. <laughs> oh, well, it, it, I, I think probably, you know, not the very first year of lessons is, is maybe not necessarily that, but depending on how quickly you progress, mm -hmm. um, if a student is able to play some short pieces in two parts, um, some short Baroque pieces, kind of book, kind of first repertoire collection books, then by the time they get to the second book, you can start incorporating some easy sight reading from early method books and from those super easy repertoire books from the first year. So I would say, you know, if you're eight years old, you could already be sight reading <laughs> and just a little bit of, just a little topical application in, in a lesson context when you start out that young. And then later you can, as a teacher, you can add a duets certainly, which is always super fun uh, and doing that on the spot with them to kind of challenge them and then pairing up, maybe pairing students up for some kind of studio class sight reading party uh, where people just kind of have fun with it and and go with the flow. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so now to the main, the core uh, content of our talk, right? So mm -hmm. I'm someone who's really bad at sight reading, for example, um, uh, let's say. And what can I do right now, today? Right to, now. To, well, to, to become a better sight reader. Well, so today you can... Uh, do a couple of things directly and a couple of things indirectly. And I would advise that you start with maybe the direct things and then also think about the indirect things. So directly speaking, of course, you just, you pick up and you read, you pick something up and you read. The general rule is that you try to read something that's below your technical level of challenge. So if you're playing a, a, um, a Clementi Sonatina, you don't want to be reading Beethoven's Hammerklavier as, as a sight reading exercise. On the other hand, if you're if you're at the level of playing a Beethoven sonata, then it's perfectly appropriate to read some Clementi sonatinas as a sight reading exercise. So what's really helpful in this is looking at some of the graded repertoire lists for say the um, ABRSM, the Royal Schools of Music Associated Board, and they have graded levels of repertoire. And if you're say, or somewhere around level seven, you can read level five or lower, depending on where you are. And that's a great way to get started, just jumping right in into the repertoire. Um, for teachers to select books, I mean, I used to go to these libraries and just kind of scope out things that looked interesting. Anything from what's coming out right now, these like Shermer performance uh, editions, Baroque to modern. Sure. Uh, can you just hold it up a little longer so that sure. our audience can see? So, right, how Leonard Piano Libraries Baroque to modern early intermediate level. Right. Sure. What's the, the what's the, what, what's it called? Uh, I mean, oh, the, that's just uh, so it's not a sight reading book. It's it's no, a, it's, a it's just regular book of pieces. Book. Sure, I yeah. See, I, I, see. I actually gotcha. think you know reading gotcha. real pieces is is the way. Mm -hmm. um, I do think for the very early exercises, you can use some um, specifically sight reading. I mean, there are books that are meant to do that, but honestly, I think reading pieces is a little more satisfying. Mm -hmm. So if you can start reading pieces right away, you should. I think you should do that. Um, any any Baroque collections, kind of easy Bach, easy Handel, you know, top hundred classical pieces, those kinds of collections. Um, gotcha. Or more advanced pianists, even Mozart pieces and Haydn and um, Cherny etudes are great for just learning some patterns. Um, all of this will help your technique because you're picking up a lot of patterns along the way mm -hmm. that are hopefully being built into your system. Uh, especially if you read not just once, but maybe a few times through, like that author was talking about. For contemporary music, there's also a lot of uh, these kinds of easy, uh, there, there's a book of easy Soviet pieces, for example, that I had on hand. I don't know where I have to put it down <laughs> in the okay. corner of my studio. I'm sorry about that. But, you can, um, yeah, you can, uh, can, you, uh, can you say that again, the book's name? Uh, it, this was an old book, but it said okay. Easy Pieces by Soviet Composers or something like that. Gotcha. And, uh, so basically just anthologies, looking through a mm -hmm. bunch of anthologies of music. Mm -hmm. um, composers that are great for younger uh, for, or kind of easier, more contemporary pieces are Alexander Tonsman, Polish French composer. He writes kind of easier music sometimes. Even lutosławski has got some pieces for children. Uh, the Russian composers, uh, Cherepnin, um, some some Kabalevsky is great. He wrote a ton of children's music that right. is classical style. Uh, there are easy pieces by Shostakovich. There are there's the whole Microcosmos by Bartok. For Bartok, right? Um, 
yeah so it's just so play good so, music by good composers so the point is read something easier than your level and um read real music basically right i think so read? i think so okay. yeah and that's so that's the direct approach is, mm -hmm. is li literally sitting down with it and doing it and i, I think mm -hmm. you know something like 10 minutes into your practice session is not incredibly difficult to mm -hmm. add but it right. com it compounds over time tremendously so it may not feel like you're going to be if you do this today for 10 minutes you're not probably going to feel like you're a better reader but if you do it today for 10 minutes and then you do it for the next three months mm -hmm. i guarantee you that three months from now you're going to feel like you can read that level of literature that you were just reading much much quicker and with less effort and gotcha possibly even at tempo gotcha um, so here's uh, actually here's to backtrack another consideration. You are not required to play things at tempo when you're trying to sight read. <laughs> so pick a tempo that you can get through reliably uh, for the piece. And in order to be able to do that, you often have to kind of scan the piece. So you don't just look at the beginning and the first page, but you open the score and you look through the piece. You see if there are any key changes. You look out for traps. Any, any places that might look like they might already be trickier just by looking at them with your eye. And before you start the piece, you can, judging by that, you can decide, okay, how quickly do I want to get into this tempo? And so this leads also into some indirect skills because in order to be able to read without a piano, you also have to have some oral skills and some theory skills. So if your musicianship skills get better, if you work on sight singing, and if you work on learning your chords and your theory, you're also going to be much better with your eye in terms of just quickly identifying what's in front of you. And you'll be able to send that signal faster to your hands and execute quicker um, the, the music that you're trying to, to read. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, what if, um, what about even more beginners? Because I, 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 I'm saying this because I know students who, uh, let's say someone who's not so familiar with, you know, sharps and flats, for example. That's just okay, one example, sure, yeah. right? So you, they, they may be able to read something in C major relatively well. They, when, when it comes to, when it has key signatures, they don't do so well when it has mm -hmm. black keys. Are there specific ways that they can, the methods that they can use to, to try to combat that fear of black notes? <laughs> Right. Well, I guess it depends what uh, what method you're using in the very beginning. So if you're using uh, a method that focuses a lot on C major and, and the related keys in the beginning, then that becomes more of an issue if you're transposing right from the very beginning um, and treating the keys as equally as you can for a six year old, say, um, it's it's a little bit easier to then work with with sharps or flats. But say say it's the first case. And in that case, I would say you have to insist on a good knowledge of scales and arpeggios, mm -hmm. particularly. So mm -hmm. if they want to, if they've been playing in C major and now they want to play in D major, mm -hmm. they're not going to get very far unless they've got the D major scale feeling right. pretty pretty well in their hands. So it ties into their how good they are with the scales, basically. It does, uh, yeah. So you do have to have some technical ability mm -hmm. but i think for a really young child you can have them playing pentascales five note scales mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in every key very quickly mm -hmm. and then you can find all kinds of pieces or you can even write your own pieces if you're a teacher or you can find the little short pieces you can buy bartok where there's a lot of um, five note scale material inside of there where the hand just stays in one place mm -hmm. and those are things that even a very young child could comfortably get to get to get to read at sight Gotcha, gotcha. So, I'm still curious about that Peabody sight reading class. I can't, <laughs> can't, can't, get, can't get over it. Um, so, besides, you know, obviously picking the correct repertoire, doing it, you know, 10 minutes a day or more, um, what do you teach in the class? What, what do they do besides just having, what do you have them do besides just having them literally read? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it was kind of like a lab based class. I mean, we really did play. So, 
uh, a lot of what we did is we read duets, piano duets, um, anything from Mozart sonatas, the ones that he wrote for his sister. To duets with you and the student, or two students. T- typically, two students getting together. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. and then kind of shaking it up. If we had a class of, say, a group of four, then we would distribute those students around, and that's um, that's to simulate what happens in real life. Which, say, in my ex- my example, mm-hmm. when I have a singer come in the room and I have a piece that's not very familiar to me, I have to react very quickly and get through the music together with them. Even if it's not going to be a note perfect performance, but we, but I have to know how to play through a piece um, without stopping, and that's a skill that we don't really, we're not made to practice when we're practicing by ourselves. When we're not performing with others, we tend to stop and correct. Mm-hmm. And um, another part of sight reading is being able to get through the whole piece uninterrupted, even if you make a mistake and you just keep your count going. Gotcha. Right. So uh, before I ask my next question, I just want to remind our audience, if you have frustrations with your sight reading uh, in your daily practice, now is your chance uh, to ask the question in the comment. Um, So I wanted to uh, just uh, elaborate. I wanted you to elaborate a little bit on how much time you one should spend on on sight reading. Um, I was talking to Nicholas the other day about how one should spend, you know, considerable considerable amount of time in mental practice. So now pianists not only have to practice their own piece, they have to mental practice, and now they have to, you know, delegate some time to sight reading. Um, what would you say? Like if, if I were only able to practice, let's say, two hours a day, one to two hours a day, uh-huh. how much time should I spend on, on sight reading? Uh, I think you can still do five to ten minutes. You can just use that as part of your warm-up. Uh, I think it's a great way to just wake your brain up in any case. If you're about to sit down at the piano, you know, play, play a few of your tech, favorite technical things that you want to get warmed up, whether it's scales or anything, you do that for five to 10 minutes and then another five to 10 minutes on something new that you want to read. And then you can go and practice the rest of your repertoire. Did you have, did you have a routine when you were growing up? Did you have a side reading routine? See, I, see, I didn't. And I wish I, I wish I had, um, my story backstory is, is kind of right. at, atypical actually okay but, i mean feel free to share <laughs> well uh, I, mean, I, I think i i think i read a lot of things by myself mm-hmm. so i think that my you mean you mean music re- mm-hmm. read as in music okay sure yeah i think whatever skills i've acquired were because of my own just my being drawn to whatever music books i had around and i would just kind of pick them up and whether or not i could actually play the repertoire or not i kind of tried Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it wasn't very structured but i think it did actually help me uh, in that way to be a better sight reader even today but when i really started thinking about it seriously then it became kind of a, a regular part of my routine and it also became kind of fun i mean it's just great to say read a new piece and it's like when you when you get to be a um a slightly more advanced pianist or just somebody who even really loves the repertoire it's a little bit like being in a candy store you just you pick a lot of things that you want to all eat at once or whatever you know and, and so it, it's it's very attractive to be able to do that and pick up a score and start reading it i totally get that i i, I recently started uh just something for fun i i i would learn a piece and, and play it every day like just a new piece like yes. a, sh- a short one like a one or two one to two minutes and it's just been so fun it's just, and yeah it's just it's uh i'm i've always i'm always used to spending you know you know two three months learning a piece but exactly well and that's is... a great that's another great exercise see what you did that's that ties into it. it it doesn't have to be you could say that it's going to be a project for you and it's going to be a piece that you actually will learn but you're going to learn it a different way than the pieces that you're normally practicing so you'll have a piece that's your sight reading project piece and you put it up on your music rack and you work on it for that five to ten minutes and it's an easy piece and eventually you will you'll learn it by say re- repeating it a bunch of times. So I'm, I'm not saying you have to throw it away, you know, the moment that you read it a couple of times through, if you, if you like the piece and you want to learn it by all means, go ahead. So um, when you are learning a piece versus when you're practicing sight reading a piece, is there a difference? I, I think so. I think in sight reading a piece, you have to rely a lot on your habits that you've already formed by the sort of deep learning that we do in, in piano lessons. So say if I 
if I pick up a piece and it's a Baroque piece, well, I'm then relying on all of the kind of ideas that are floating around my head about what Baroque music should sound like in order for me to have sort of an instinctual articulation and uh, spontaneous decisions about where to play staccato, where to phrase and these kinds of things. That's more of a style issue. And that's another indirect thing I, I don't want to forego mentioning because I think that's really important, just listening a lot. So if you want to get better at sight reading, you should also listen as much as possible to different kinds of music and preferably with a score in front of you so you can kind of follow along. That goes from anyone intermediate up. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can listen to pieces in a similar style to the one you're learning, you're going to pick up all kinds of information that becomes sort of subconscious and a part of you that makes it easier to not have to deliberately decide while you're reading what you're going to do. You just kind of go for it because you know that that gesture, for example, th this kind of shape, this kind of gesture, this requires that in this style, if that makes any sense. Yes, yes. That's yeah. what I found as well. Like, for example, if uh, if I've I've listened to enough Mozart operas, uh, symphonies, and 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 concertos, concerti, um, it, I find playing Mozart sonatas easier. Just, Absolutely, it's, it's yeah. just yeah, it's it's a it's it's a much easier process when I I know what to expect almost uh, even without you know read, really reading the notes. I think that really. Uh, it, that that's sort of what you're saying. Absolutely, and I think uh, listening to music that's not piano music is crucial because you get those ideas. The piano is really good at imitating other instruments, and composers often do that in their pieces as they try to they have some idea in mind about a color or an articulation that comes from either string instrument or woodwind instrument. And for you to be listening to orchestral music or singers, you get a whole other idea about breathing and phrasing. Uh, that you can then bring into your piano playing. I, I actually think we learn probably the most from listening to other instruments than we do from uh, even from listening to other pianists play. Gotcha. So the key is to listen a lot to different genre, uh, different different instruments, and and especially in similar style to the stuff that you're trying to side mm -hmm. read. Yeah. Sure. Uh, one last bit of detail uh, that I didn't want to uh, leave behind when you're side reading. Um, is it okay to do it, you know, separate hands, like you're learning a piece, or would you say you really should just put both hands in, in, in a consistent tempo? Probably not. I think, I think you should try to go for absorbing as much information from the page as you can. Now, part of sight reading also is being good at prioritizing what's important. And that comes from a better knowledge of music and also from a uh, good knowledge of theory. But we know from most music until about 1900, we can bet that the bass line is going to be really important and some kind of third in the harmony that will give us information and then the melody. So even if the chord is a huge chord that somehow is, has all of these bass notes and arpeggios or something, if it's a, you know, a chord like that, all you really need is that to simulate it, to get the right. same kind of information. And what I played just there was, was a bass note with with three notes in the right hand. So okay. it's a, you, you can learn also some techniques for quote unquote cheating, but not really cheating, just kind of extracting uh -huh, information uh -huh. quickly. That's, but that's for more advanced, right? Like more advanced, uh, if you yeah, have but so, complicated chords, uh, yeah, you can. You uh -huh. can but it, but if, you're, if you're young, then f I think find pieces that you can try both hands together. Um, now it's, again, it's all contextual, right? So it depends on who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. if, if you really have, if you feel like you can't read anything right now mm -hmm. and you have tons of trouble, then of course it's okay. What, read one line, you know, mm -hmm. get good at reading one line. Right. If you can't, if you're having trouble doing both hands together, get good at reading one line. Or if you have more trouble reading, reading the bass clef versus the treble clef, work on the bass clef more. Sometimes the things that help that most are sight singing books and little, uh, you could pick up a hymnal or pick up something like, um, like a sight reading book for oral skills or solfege books, anything like that with solfege in it. And you just practice either playing it or singing it, hearing it, and then you're most likely going to overcome that challenge. I see. How long do you think before, you know, uh, if someone were to, to start consistently practice sight reading, how long do you think it will take them to notice their improvements? <laughs> I, I think, I think you'll start noticing it 
probably in a few weeks already. Okay, that's soon. Like you'll start to notice some things changing about how you look at music and how you're looking at a particular repertoire. I think you're really going to feel a lot more uh, confident if you're doing it consistently after a few months, you know, six months, something like that, three to six months, you'll be like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm so much better than I was. Uh, and obviously, if you continue that for a couple of years, you're you're really going to notice a difference from wh right. where you started. Right. So remember, guys, <laughs> 10 minutes a day, at least, right? <laughs> 10 minutes yeah, a day. Yeah, but, but yeah. But keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Do you do um, do you do side reading exercises with your students uh, when you when you teach piano? Uh, yeah, I, I sometimes will, would just put something in front of them to okay. either to see where they're at um, gotcha. or to, but I, but I actually, what I like to do is, is read as, as a duo. So to, to get some music where right. I'm playing they're a more difficult undo part and they're playing a primo part that's a little bit easier for them. And it's way more fun than just reading yeah. I think <laughs> you know, so, a single yeah. note line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gotcha. All right.